from Microbe TV, this is Tuivo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 73, recorded on December 22nd, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels LD. Hey, hey Vincent, Vincent, great, great to be, be back, back after, after a little, little bit of a accidental hiatus. hiatus. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> we haven't, we actually recorded two months ago. October 20th. No, we, we missed, missed our Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving episode, episode and um, <clears throat> a little, little bit of scheduling, scheduling complications, to say the least. least. Um, and we've, we've got, got two really spectacular, spectacular guests lined, lined up into town into, into the new year. year. Um, and, and by, by no, no fault of, uh, of the guests, uh, both, both your and my schedules, schedules really, really kind of heated heat up. up. But, but we'll, we'll, we'll make, make up, up for this, this maybe, maybe even sneak in our missed episode here sometime early in the new year. So how are things in uh, Salt Lake City now? As I just spoke with Jason Shepard the other day. <laughs> on Fantastic. Twins. Your other, one, one of the other podcasts. podcasts in the, yeah. In the, the Empire. Empire. Twin, Twin this, this week in Neuro. Neuro. Yeah, yeah. we've got uh, several places where more than one pod. We have Utah and Michigan. We have two podcasters in each place. <laughs> <laughs> Spreading, Spreading across, across the country. country. That's, That's fantastic. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so what's, what's happened, happened in the two, two months? months? Anything, Anything on the virus front that we might want to... Can you think of any, things have been emerged? things have been kind of quiet, huh? Don't you think? <laughs> I don't know about that. Uh, was, so we yeah. so we're saying we got an echo here. Let's see if we can figure this out. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah I see. Happened. I see what the problem is. I'm going to fix oh, it good. right there. Fantastic. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, that should do it. Uh, I had the wrong input for the mic. Sorry. Oh no. So no let, let me let me. Um, okay, just we have about a, a thirty second guess. Um, so, uh, lag and and uh, they should be uh... all right. So you just need to say echo. You don't need to say terrible echo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll solve it. <laughs> so it should be fixed. I'm going to wait for your response. Yeah, okay, I'll... Steph says it's fixed. Thank oh, you. Fantastic. Good news. Um, my fault. By the way, Steph, Mr. Ozzy Cam, who else is here moderating for us today? Um, Looks like is is less here. No, he was here this morning. Okay, Mr. Ozzy Cam and uh, Steph, thank you for moderating again. Thank you for pointing out. And uh, yeah, I, I had the wrong input. I'm uh, I'm, I'm no, faulty. Anyway, you were saying um, <laughs> what's happening in the virus world? Yeah, <laughs> that was well, tongue was, in cheek, right? <laughs> yeah, that was tongue in cheek. So I was actually looking back. I mean, it's amazing to think. So last year, about this time. You and I recorded episode sixty-three, um, the year of year of the coronavirus, and we were speculating about a variant of SARS two called at the time B point one point one point seven, which mm -hmm. later yeah. became Alpha. Alpha, yeah, in the Greek alphabet, and there was quite a bit of controversy about when is it going to hit in the U.S. Is it really going to sweep through? Um, and so, actually, you know, kind of this year on, we can. You know, we can kind of do a retrospective a little bit. Um, and Alpha did start to gain um, in prevalence and frequency in the U.S., but then got sort of blindsided by this, uh, of course, the variant that's been in the news for months now, Delta. Mm -hmm. um, and then we stepped out for about a month. And, of course, um, everything got sweeped up all over again now that we're talking about Omicron. Right. Yeah. And so... It's really, you know, an evolutionary curveball here, I would say. So I was just scouring Twitter um, in the last couple of days, and one of my science buddies, uh, science heroes, Dmitry Petrov, he's a professor in biology at Stanford, had a tweet where he said, uh, once at an evolution conference, a student from my lab showed simulations with selection coefficients on the order of 10 to 100%. So this is the selection coefficient is how much of an advantage could a mutation or a variant have relative to the rest of the population. Mm -hmm. um, and that number would uh, kind of hint at some of the dynamics we're seeing today with Omicron sweeping across the world. Um, and Dimitri said when he brought this up or this was discussed at these evolution conferences a few years ago, this elicited laughter. At a bar, I was told that such strong selection is implausible and silly to model. I think by now COVID taught us otherwise. And that's 
<laughs> what's happening in real time here? My goodness, this thing is really sweeping through. So basically, Nels, there's nothing like real life to show what you can do. So in silico, models, all of that uh, algorithmic stuff it doesn't come close to real life. Is that the conclusion? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's that our assumptions that where, and actually in the field of evolutionary biology and population genetics in particular, you know, this has been a lot of the theory and the ideas have been driven in this sort of, sort of hypothetical space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and another way of putting it is the, um, instead of the law of averages, the flaw of averages when it comes to evolution. And so, you know, at any given interval of time, there might not be like a, a massive event, evolutionary event happening. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then in these sort of short bursts, you can see things. And this is where Omicron is teaching um, some of the theorists today or reminding them, I would say there's, there are many um, examples of this, but is that things can move really fast, just as you're saying, Vincent, in real life um, compared. And so over, if you average out over millennia, then, you know, the ideas or the variables, the parameters that you put into some of the models might be way more modest than these sort of bursts of action that we're seeing, um, whether it was the alpha wave, the delta wave, or now the Omicron wave. All right. So we, we I have two questions for you. We, yeah. we talked about HIV today, and there clearly have emerged subtypes over the years, right? right. Which are similar in phenomena, although far greater sequence divergence than we see for SARS-CoV-2. Absolutely. But it seems to me that this has the subtypes of HIV have not led to the same uh, hysteria. Can I say that? <laughs> <laughs> you can. Of course you can. So, and by the way, I just wanted to mention, I hopped in briefly on your virology live, um, live stream today, and my God, I was impressed. I feel like I'm moving at about one quarter speed compared to the like questions you were fielding in real time, the density of information there, uh, really. And, a lot of fun. Uh, it's great fun. Yeah, Very great exchange with great questions, wonderful. great audience participation, uh, really, really inspiring. Um, but yeah, so your, your question about HIV is a good one. I think, you know, here my, my first response is to consider like differences in transmission. So a respiratory virus versus mm. one that's transmitted through sexual contact. Um, or blood contact and what that means in terms of um, you know some of the dynamics um, if you're if you're literally breathing something in and out how fast evolution can move or the selection that then is imposed on um, a process like this so I think you know I, that, I would point to that first of all but secondly um, and this might be what you're getting at too Vincent is you know the way we followed the HIV pandemic in early days versus how we're following this one is like a night and day difference based on genomic technology largely, right? So the fact that we kind of at our fingertips have 5 million SARS-2 sequences at a year into or two years into this pandemic versus two years into HIV, you know, remind me, did we even have like how many genomes did we have assembled? Yeah. At that point, yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, probably just a handful at most or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Nels, when I talk, I can hear echo on your side. Maybe your volume is too loud of playing me. Can you lower it a bit? Oh, yeah. Let me do that. Because yeah. you're not using headphones today. I can change that very quickly. I, I can, you probably have too much hair today to wear headphones, right? <laughs> That's right. So, I mentioned I'm, uh, I've suspended all um, personal grooming through 2021 <laughs> as I uh, prepare to hibernate here for the next few weeks. Um, which I think is a good public health message, actually, is to yeah. maybe observe a brief hibernation. So I wanted to bring up this uh, question of K-Bands. Any ideas as to what the fitness advantage? So we have achieved something. We got people talking about fitness, Nels. Yeah. Whereas the greater world is still talking about transmission advantage. But, you know, we're the, we're the cognoscenti, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, th I mean... It simply cannot be that every variant is more transmissible than the previous. It simply cannot be. It's a fitness advantage, as we've been saying. So what's the fitness advantage? And I would say for all of them, we really don't know. I mean, I, probably antigenic advantage is part of it, but right. Yeah, that's right. And this is, you know, this disconnect that we've talked about a lot um, between how fast we can catalog variation in the, yeah. in the variants. We can define that really quickly versus the lag in actually doing the experiments. Um you know, I um, saw a really interesting preprint recently by a virologist 
a coronavirologist. There are a, a few of these sort of card carrying folks. This is Vineet <laughs> Menachery, who came out of Ralph Barrick's lab. And in their in vitro systems, they were doing um, uh, infections with um, playing around with removing parts of the spike. And so, of course, everyone's looking at the receptor binding domain, the furin cleavage site in particular. Mm -hmm. um, Vineet and his crew noticed there's another set of amino acids nearby, um, maybe, um, you know, eight amino acids, so 24 nucleotide letters. Um, when they pulled that out um, from Omicron, they saw very different uh, uh, plaque numbers and tempo in their uh, cell infection experiments. And so, mm. um, you know, we might start to get these clues, but this is now you know, weeks later. And so the, sp the speed of the virology is pretty impressive, but the sequencing is going so fast that there's still, yes, yes. I think, this mismatch in understanding. Well, Del Nels, we did a paper on TWIV recently where they took Delta and infected human uh, bronchial explant cells, you know, epithelial cells, which is pretty much the cell you want to look at, right, for, for looking at phenotypic differences. And there were none between, you know, ancestral, uh, alpha, and delta. And so it makes you wonder uh, how hard it's going to be to tease this out, right? It yeah, may, absolutely it, right. Yep. Of course, in the in cell culture, there's no immune system, so if, it may be well that the uh, antigenic changes are key, as they are for influenza, right? Yeah, agreed. <clears throat> and that's where again the challenge of um, so the speed with which you can move, um, which is already pretty tricky in these cell systems. But then if you're thinking about whole, first of all, what is is the proper animal model, and how long does it take? To oh, be sure. Sure. And, yeah, that's a whole other sort of degree of difficulty there for sure. I think animal models are problematic. They give you clues, yep. but unfortunately, they're never going to answer. And so we are left in the end. Um, the, the virology textbooks, of which I'm an author of one, will will not be able to conclude much about fitness uh, because the, the experiments are not going to be revelatory. I hope I'm wrong. Right? Yeah, I agree. And this is, but you know, this is like all. Um, moments in science, right? The whole point of doing this is that we're sort of challenged with the unknown, something we don't understand. And so then that inspires folks to think about, okay, well, how do we tackle this thing that we haven't done before? Yeah. And if we knew the answer to that today, in one sense, it wouldn't be science. It'd be more sort of turning the crank on what we already know. And so I have, I'm holding some optimism that maybe, you know, not next week, not next month, but a decade from now, are there new ways to sort of triangulate on some of these uh, features, doing both kind of classic and traditional virology, mixing that with an evolutionary viewpoint, adding in what you can learn from um, some of the genomic epidemiology as well. And can we actually come up with a new understanding that's that's more robust? I think we're at the infancy of that. I don't know mm -hmm. what that looks like exactly, but, but I think, you know, <laughs> every day the record of um, SARS-2 diversity gets larger and the possibility of someone becoming inspired on how to tackle that in a new way to gain some understanding of to, to link genotype to phenotype, you know, genotype, the the variation in the viruses to actual fitness outcomes. Um, there could be a, some some tricks and some ways forward. So, I hope you're right. That would yeah. be great. Stay tuned. So yeah. we're not going to solve that question today, but <laughs> we, <laughs> we do have some fun I think items to discuss here. Um, and maybe actually before we're going to do a pre proof, which is basically a paper about to be, I guess, being a paper being born. Um, and then um, we'll dig into this one, um, which gets at some of uh, ways of tackling the, uh, again, more observation, I would say, than understanding. But how, are, how is SARS 2 changing in real time? Um, within a host and then between hosts, which is a, which is an interesting distinction that we will we will dig into, um, and then a post on virological.org, so the, sort of the equivalent of a preprint um, that considers a different method of, of. So we think about those point mutations, right? The um, some of them now famous um, at position five hundred one of the spike protein. We have seen the convergent evolution of a change there multiple times. Um, but we'll hear we'll, we'll consider a different way of the virus can change by literally grabbing sequence or recombining, bringing in new sequences, including some from the hosts. And that might provide some clues actually about the origins of Omicron, this idea that it sort of, you know, where did it come from actually? And so um, right before the show, I went on to 
nextstrain.org and did a quick screen grab. I don't, can you share that, Vincent? I will. Yes. Let me uh, bring it up. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Perfect. Make it so, a little smaller so you guys can. There you go. Yeah, that looks great. So um, uh, a little peek at behind the scenes here at our show notes. Um, and so <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a, a tree um, of virus diversity, SARS-2 diversity, but it's just like any other evolutionary tree, phylogenetic tree that you might see. It's color coded. Um, depending on your screen, it might be a little small, but this is um, just scraping some of the whole genomes that are being deposited in um, publicly available databases. And so what you can see kind of dominating where Vincent has the um, cross arrow there is this uh, teal colored. Each dot mm -hmm. is a different virus genome. Yeah, exactly. And so Delta. Vincent's circling um, the major sort of lineage of the Delta variant of SARS-2 yeah. there. Um, Delta has split off. I think we talked a couple months ago that there's someone had proposed there's like 45 different flavors of Delta, <laughs> yeah, yeah. different <laughs> variants within a variant, so to speak. Yeah. Um, you can see two others sort of below. So in kind of yeah. those bluish colors. Yeah. Um, below that, you can actually see the rise in the fall of the Alpha strain. So this is now a completely different lineage. If you kind of trace backwards into the gray, these are all the other yeah. variants out there. And there's a deep branch. Um, in really small print, there are the years. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think we're looking at the whole, the whole enchilada here from 2019 to 2020. Um, and that was about a year ago when we were um, debating a little bit, like what's going to really go on here potentially with uh, what became described, called the alpha strain. And so that's what you see in purple in the middle here is the appearance of alpha. Right here, uh, yeah. Delta was kind of hiding in the wings um, out of the conversation. And then what you'll notice is in recent times, so coming into the summer um, and yep, of right 2021, exactly, yeah. is that now as sampling is happening, there's fewer and fewer of these alpha variants turning and up. And Delta's going crazy, right? Exactly. Overwhelmed by Delta. Um, but there's a new horse in the race here, which of course has been gathering all of the news headlines in the last several weeks, which is Omicron. It, yep. Which Vincent is circling here in red. And so this one is moving really quickly um, in, in, in comparison, you know, to alpha and Delta. And so there's only a few viruses sampled here from a few weeks ago, but I can guarantee you if you come back, you know, as we extend in, in the next quarter, through the winter mm. that the number of red dots here um, will um, will greatly increase. The reason we're kind of on top of this is not because the, so the sequencing is still takes about a week or so to catch up um, and then um, to get deposited. Um, the reason that, you know, the, that the people, this has caught people's attention is that the, this variant Omicron is giving away a clue that it's different than the Delta wave. And that's just in the way we diagnose the, we do the PCR reactions, the so-called S dropout, um, which gave away that there was a, uh, sort of this new variant in town, which is turning out to be Omicron in all, in, in most or all cases. And so um, to be the, you know, future to be written here, but the, the key, uh, you know, one big question is, well, where did this come from in the first place? And so um, most evolutionary geneticists, I would say, and, uh, genomic epidemiologists were imagining that the next sort of, the, so it's not surprising that, that more variants are emerging. This is what viruses do um, for a living. Uh, we're just, we're watching it at a resolution and time scale that we've never done before with all of this technology. Um, but most of these folks were thinking that because Delta was so successful, that it would be likely that somewhere coming out of that, the teal or the, the lighter blue part of the tree, all of those samples that, that something like Omicron or the next variant would emerge from there. The reason being that because most of these viruses were Delta, that's where the mutations are happening in, in sort of the most frequency. And so just by a probability that you'd imagine as these viruses are competing, as the variants are competing, that it would actually sort of compete against something very similar. Um, the surprise was that that, you know, as you saw a minute ago, that little red tree or that the branch on the tree actually emerges from a very deep branch. So it's quite different mm -hmm. um, than the Delta variant. And so we'll return, I think at the end of our, of our podcast um, to that question of origins of Omicron or a little bit of a curveball here 
um, in terms of a, a very different in terms of the collection of mutations. That means it's not associated with the delta part of the tree. <clears throat> it's associated really with its own yeah. branch that's kind of scrunched in with some of the other variants there. So for all the other variants, Nels, did they emerge from the predominant variant? It's hard to see from this because it's so compressed at the left here. But. It's correct. Yeah, it's so compressed. And so, yeah, you have basically, um, you know, that's exactly right. And so there's, you know, within there, I think there's something like you can just even see from the color coding, you know, there's um, something like 20 different lineages. And so yeah. it's really compressed down here. But they were all, you know, those original events um, that were... Um, uh, coming out of Wuhan in the fall of 2019. Um, that's really sort of the, that's the kind of root of the tree here. And there's some open discussion, some controversy over, um, was it a single spillover event? Was it two spillover events um, at wet markets, et cetera? And so that's still, people are, there's several groups um, that are actively pursuing, trying to um, date the earliest cases. And there've been some new information um, that's that's come out along those lines um, and still, yeah, very, very active, very controversial as it's uh, obviously swirls with world politics as well. Um, and then I'll probably sidestep it, but brings in the whole, you know, uh, ongoing controversy about the origins being a natural spillover or something going on in a laboratory nearby at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. But now, um, sur surely you can trace back Omicron to an ancestor, right? Yeah, you can. You 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 can. Although it gets a, it turns out to get a little bit murky. So like to know the exact because they so the, as the branches are deeper, um, it's very easy if you have a lot of closely related viruses um, that fall right there. Mm -hmm. um, but as you have these deeper branches, um, it actually is roughly the <laughs> roughly the equivalent amount of genetic difference between yeah. sort of a possible direct ancestor, so to speak. So that's yeah. So that's where the um you know some of the, the if there is more sampling um i mean already you know this is unprecedented the amount of sampling we have um but if we had more sampling that was happening and that branch you know is it, and you have to take it with a grain of salt but it traces back pretty deeply into 2020 so it wasn't like this thing just sort of emerged um you know a month ago um there's a deeper evolutionary history here and so um that will be, I mean, that's also a very active area of research right now as well as just, is there a better way of pinpointing um, where this came from? And then there's some really interesting ideas about whether, oh yeah, and here's another way of looking at this um, sim see very similar that, data set. Yeah, that makes it um, clear how different Omicron is, right? Yeah, yeah. So here we're looking, the tree has basically just been bent around into sort of a phylogenetic bush, so to speak. And so, <laughs> yeah, you can see the... Uh, massive sampling of Delta, um, again, in the teal, same color codes. And then, um, as Vincent's pointing out with the arrow there, the just the little, um, the, a couple of samples of Omicron here that are, um, again, it gets pretty, <laughs> it's actually, you know, in some sense, the illustration is compressed, which makes it a little yeah. mysterious, but that's actually kind of a fair representation in real life. Um, the exact placement of Omicron with that long branch on the tree um, is somewhat controversial because of the sampling at those at those nodes around there. Um, yeah, this is also a bit misleading because we have so many more delta isolates, right? Correct. Yeah, and so that will, um, you know, that's going to change as the as the um, the sort of tempo of sampling, um, it's the tide is turning. Although there are, you know, it's interesting. So there is, I think, where it's Omicron is moving so quickly, at least in South Africa, for example, um, that it's. You know, yeah. one, one end could even be on the decline. Um, it, there's some data consistent with that in the last few days. I think it's too early to really conclude that. Mm. Um, but if that's true, this is going to be maybe, you know, um, I'm trying to think of the analogy here. Instead of like a wave crashing in slow motion, it could just be like a pulse coming through um, uh, in, in terms of this variant with um, either more delta on the backside of it or some variant of delta could be a, could be a possibility. This is... Um, definitely speculating based on very limited data that's just sort of emerging here in real time. Um, but already, um, I think both in um, South Africa and then I think I saw some data maybe from Denmark, which mm -hmm. is um, really good with genomic level surveillance of SARS-2. Um, and it's possible that there's a, a, even just kind of in the last three or four days, a, a trend line going down, but we'll have to kind of wait and see. Yeah, it's hard to see. These pies are all showing mostly 
Delta, right? That's right. So the next strain, the sampling that they're using, so because they're doing whole genomes, it's a little bit late to the game here. Yeah. We're just seeing kind of, you know, if we correlated this with the news headlines, um, right when South Africa, some of the um, epidemiologists there were reporting Omicron for the first time, that's kind of where next strain is sitting, where you, you just have a few of the genomes here. Um, and by the way, I'm sure this has been in the discussions on TWIV um, and some of the other podcasts, but um, my hat's off to um, the public health folks in South Africa for sharing this information as soon as possible, which had some real pro political ramifications in terms of the um, travel restrictions or bans, yeah. um, which are s starting to be lifted. I think we're well overdue for <laughs> lifting that in the US. I mean, my goodness, like <laughs> the, I mean, as you're seeing in New York, right? I think most of the cases are now that are being identified are Omicron. That's even true in Utah. So just even over the last, over the last weekend, um, I think we went from something like 6% to 30% um, of the cases being measured. And by, you know, this time, but by the time the podcast is posted on microbe.tv, um, mm -hmm. it'll be well, you know, well into the majority here. Um, so really, a, a, a unusual scenario. Let me, let uh, me get our, your thoughts on this question from Mark. Um, is there any precedent for Omicron's fast spread? And I would say it's, Probably no different than influenza variants that spread, right? I agree, Vincent. Yeah. And, um, you know, that ascertainment bias, the fact that we're watching this like in real time and then exactly the, the danger is, is that then as this gets whipped up into the headlines, right? I mean, so honestly, um, and this speculating again, and, and I will say, you know, um, last year, the conversation uh, we were having and epidemiologists we're having with virologists, which is, it's sometimes, uh, there's some friction. Um, I think we've learned a little <laughs> bit about how to communicate. Um, I think we're seeing a lot more measured um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, ideas, not, not in every corner, but uh, maybe as a general trend, um, as some of the data has been emerging and speculation has happened, I think it's been couched that way uh, much more effectively. Hopefully this is like leading to better, opportunities for having conversations, trying to figure this out as, as we're all coming at this from different sort of scientific backgrounds, et cetera. Um, but yeah, your point is a really good one, Vincent, which is that, you know, um, viruses. So as we've always said, like viruses mutate, viruses evolve. And so these kind of dynamics, there's no reason to think SARS-2 is different um, than pandemics of the past, which stretch back all the way, certainly the origin of our species. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, the, um, I think it's what you can see and can't see. So again, the fact that we're measuring the S dropout in this case, just the PCR tests are really like, we're attuned to seeing this. There's probably in all kinds of ancient coronavirus pandemics or influenza, other respiratory sure. viruses, there's probably waves like this that are constantly happening. And by the way, in some cases could be really, um, more mild. And so mm -hmm. is it that. Um, again, this is speculating, but um, there is at least some emerging data that Omicron is a more mild infection. And so as this thing is sweeping rapidly, what are the invisible dynamics here? So this would be the people who are infected with the variant, but have no symptoms at all, no idea that they're even infected. And is how much is that at play with the dynamics? Um, I'm seeing some, I think some interesting ideas emerging there that this sort of pulse of Omicron, if that's what happens um, in that this sort of, you know, crests and then declines really rapidly in, in very different tempo than some of the other variants, Delta, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, um, that that might hint at sort of these uh, more invisible dynamics where there's the percentage of asymptomatic asymptomatic um, infections is a lot higher potentially. Well, but, I, think you know, you, I think you have to be careful because yeah. if, all, if, if it's in a vaccinated person, it will be less severe because Correct. of the vaccine. And nothing to do with the, vi the virus itself. So I think those data have to be stratified and they aren't often. Yeah, you're right. And that, that's, a, that's a really important point. Um, I've seen some estimates that, um, you know, transmission of Omicron is like 100% more than the original SARS-2. But that's, a, it's a whole, whole different ballgame in terms of um, immune sort of memory 
whether that's vaccine generated or whether that's natural immunity from mm. previous SARS-2 infections. It's a whole different, yeah, it's a moving target on both sides. And I think um, the data is, is necessarily at this early stage patchy, um, but sometimes misses that dynamic where this is like, you know, it's a moving target on, on both sides, the hosts and the viruses. The other important, of course, public health message is that even if this is a very mild um, variant, um, the numbers game can catch up really quickly. So I think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think New York's hospitals are in relatively good shape mm -hmm. um, in, in the pandemic. Utah's are not. So there's still mm. kind of the crest of a Delta yeah. wave going on here. We have fewer vaccinated individuals and we actually have fewer or, or we have more immune naive individuals who've just never been mm, yeah, um, yeah, infected. Yeah. So, you know, population densities, especially out state are pretty low. And so, um, so that's sort of a recipe actually for a public health issue where very quickly, even with a mild variant, um, you can overwhelm health systems. And so I think that's going to, un unfortunately we might, you know, that will into January and February, um, we'll have to watch and see how that um, affects the situation as well. Okay, but public health isn't necessarily my strong suit, as you know, Vincent. So why don't we, why don't we pivot into, into our uh, our preproof here? So the um, paper um, that's just going to be published soon in the journal Cell Reports is titled Two Step Fitness Selection for Intrahost Variation in SARS CoV 2. Um, and here's the, yep, here's the the printout. So preproof, this is like even a step before a proof. So they're trying to get the information out so quickly at the journal that they haven't even formatted it yet um, in the in the sort of mm -hmm. house form for cell reports. Um, and then the authors will very likely still go through a review process looking for typos, et cetera, um, which can happen, um, incidentally, pretty often. And so in the kind of publication process, try to fix that up um, before it gets officially published. But you know, certainly a lot of interest to um, to understand um, th some of the analysis of the virus um, as it comes out. And so in this case, looking at intra-host variation um, and how that might differ from population level as we look at as the viruses that show up in the genomes that show up in databases, um, like the one that built that the tree that we just showed, um, are there are there interesting differences there? So um, before we dig in to the meat of the paper, six co-first authors, um, a lot of, uh, <laughs> this is, you know, a lot of groups um, really kind of assembling in, in ways to, to contribute and to try to move our understanding, the needle on our understanding of SARS-2. Um, this group is uh, mainly out of Beijing. So senior author lead, lead contact is um, Chen Chen um, from the Biomedical Innovation Center in Beijing. Um, and then the uh, first authors are mostly from the Beijing Daitan Hospital, which is part of Capital Medical University, also in, in Beijing. Um, and so this will become important because we'll, we'll actually be considering mutation analysis of, for, of samples collected from patients in some of these hospitals in and around Beijing. Um, and so as the title kind of hints, the authors here are um, you know, one of the first studies, there's one or two others, I think they've been published already, and I'm sure there's others going on, but looking for, um, as you sequence the genomes of SARS-2 um, over time in a single patient, what is the, what are the kind of mutations that arise? And what do those look like kind of in that private history of a infection in a single person, a single patient versus between patients or what we just see as we sample kind of SARS-2 uh, around the globe? In real time, so there's two key definitions here. One is the um, that they use to identify the difference here: an ISNV, I S N V, which is a, a shorthand for an intra-host single nucleotide variation. And so this is simply a letter change in the genome um, that comes from a, a single patient sample. And this is compared to a SNP, um, which is a common genetics term, a single nucleotide polymorphism. Um, and this is a mutation sort of at the population level. In this case, they're comparing. So a polymorphism is a different from a sort of a, a set comparator. Um, and the comparison here is to the Wuhan WHO1 virus sequence. And so this is one of the, I think this might be the first one, um, January 2020, almost two years ago, that was fully sequenced. And then the polymorphisms are the changes there. And so the, the you know, the big idea here 
is that natural selection could be acting a little bit differently within a host um, where you just have the virus sort of setting up shop over the course of infection, which if it's a long COVID scenario, could be over the course of months. Um, and then, uh, you know, compared to the wild sequences from uh, among hosts, as I was mentioning before. So um, to do this, the authors um, ended up with um, good quality data from about 170 patients in hospitals in Beijing. And this is, you know, again, as we were just discussing a few minutes ago, this is sort of, you know, science in real time. So um, all of these samples were taken before May 2020, um, which is like ancient history, actually, for like SARS-2 today, um, but reflects how long it takes to do studies like this, right? It takes real time, at least a year. And this is already probably a pretty accelerated calendar versus, um, you know, sort of non-pandemic science, I would say. So and from this, they get 400 samples. So and that's because among these 170 patients, they're taking samples at different time points as the infection um, is unfolding. Um, with these folks who are hospitalized. Um, and then they do uh, sort of standard sequencing of the um, SARS-2 genome, target um, capture sequencing, short reads, and um, do a lot of filtering. So if they get 100x coverage or more, they're using um, those data sets. Um, and so they pruned back their data this way. Um, and then they have, um, you know, define what they're looking for in terms of what they think is a real mutation, a real ISNIV in an individual, and that's when they see that mutation at at least 5% frequency among those. So if, if it's at 100x coverage, they wanna see that mutation show up at least five times in that 100 so that they'll believe it. And they're, you know, what they're doing is they're trying to not get fooled by sequence error, um, which mm -hmm. can happen. And so you can't really trust um, the sequences you get at lower levels. Um, and so they found about in their sample set of 170 patients or so, collected over a few times, they found about 7,000 uh, mutations among this. And, you know, maybe a few interesting surprises. So um, Spike, which gets all the attention and which at the population level has fixed the most mutations or you see the most variation, um, actually wasn't the highest uh, sort of gene region of the genome hit with these mutations. It was actually ORF8, um, which was the highest, followed by the N gene. Um, and this is all in figure one of the pre-proof. Um, and so, um, you know, already maybe some hints that the kind of variation that you would measure in a single patient over time would be different than you'd measure in the population over time, where spike mutations are, are out, far outnumbering um, in, in other genomic regions. Although I think, as we've discussed, Vincent, on a few shows, the other regions of the genome and the changes there, there's probably some real virology happening that I think is sort of underappreciated um, in terms of how this virus works. So, um, once they had cataloged all this variability and kind of put it onto the um, onto the genome, the regions where they see the mutations, then they could start to ask questions about, okay, well, what does this variation look like? And then ultimately, how does it compare um, to the to, to the larger population in general? And so, already, I think you know, kind of a wild finding here that eighty percent of their ISNVs, eighty percent of the mutations above five percent, were all in one single patient out of the hundred seventy. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it, this, like, this is a really interesting patient um, or a really interesting case of virus evolution. And I think this maybe hints at um, maybe a little bit as we're kind of continuing the thread on where did Omicron come from? So one of the leading ideas is that the virus was sort of hiding out in perhaps an immunocompromised patient. They don't mm -hmm. um, do anything more in terms of um, describing the demographics of the patient where 80% of their mutations arose. I, that, that's one thing I would have, might have asked about as a reviewer um, of the paper. Um, but, you know, is it really in these chronic, are these, these outlier chronic infections where the virus is kind of going into hyperdrive in a sense or sampling these unique mutations and then might emerge into a population? Um, and could that sort of be one route or, or would, is that consistent? Um, with what we're seeing with Omicron, and I think the answer is maybe. Um, I don't think we don't have definitive proof either way, and there's some other ideas out there that we'll talk about. But the fact that you have these really outlier histories um, for some patients in terms of the genetic diversity that gets propagated in that single infection is, I think, that's an important clue here. Um, and I'm guessing that we'll see more of this along these lines, um, especially as we think about the size of the immunocompromised population of humans, which is um, probably as big as it's ever been. Um, and that might be something unique 
with the SARS-2 pandemic. I don't know if you remember the paper out of Boulder where they, you know, they'd been randomly doing PCR on students. And so they quantified them by CT. And I think, what, 20% had 90% of the viral RNA loads because there are certain people. And those are probably the super, the ones who spread, right? Yep, because exactly right. 80% yep. uh, is spread by 20% of the people. So maybe in this case, that's the person where you have really high virus titers, a lot of reproduction, and you get the most eye snips, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's a, I think that's a great question. Like, so that the, in, the potential intersection between exactly what you're, subs, you're describing, the super spreaders that was identified in that Boulder data yeah. um, that was uh, spearheaded by one of my close science buddies, Sarah Sawyer. That's um, right. We were that's right. Together. <laughs> yep. And, um, and then, um, yeah, but, and then this, this genetic diversity, which isn't just sort of even, evenly this, you know, there's, average diversity, but there could be these bursts. And so if that diversity and super spreader intersect, that's an interest. I mean, that's a potentially evolutionarily interesting event. It could and it, go- it, Eventually they will when you have so many people infected, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it could, and it, of course, it could end up in need to flame out, which probably happens most times, but there could be that combination of a lot of diversity or sampling a lot of diversity, some selection at the single patient level, and then a super spreader scenario, which is the- the tempo that has been observed in many cases, yeah, this could be some real clues about, um, you know, as we unfortunately are probably marching down the Greek alphabet, um, we might see some more examples of this. Um, okay, so then, so that was sort of the one, like, kind of um, exclamation point I was seeing there. Um, still, um, tw another 20% of the um, ISNIB, so almost the entire data set, like, is basically found only in two patients. Um, so, I think this underlines this really private history. And so it's only a handful, I think 16, you know, dozen or so um, of these mutations that were shared between many patients. Um, and of those, about a dozen that you actually see very commonly at the population level. And so mm -hmm. that's this sort of overlap between what's happening in any single infection um, to what's sort of out there in the population. Um, and of course, so the difference here is in a single patient, you can imagine the virus would rise um, during the in, uh, infectious shedding state and then fall as the patient recovers and clears the virus. Um, but then the question becomes, does it actually get transmitted? Does it get passed to another host? And so that's a different sort of part of the replication um, propagation of the mm -hmm. virus. Um, and so, <clears throat> um, you know, so the, um, I think the early returns here are that there's this underlying level of diversification in patients, which is probably almost always, and this isn't a surprise, but it's always mm -hmm. locked, right? It's not transmitted along. And so all of these privacy, and then the rare case um, where it sort of catches hold, and then um, in some cases might even then compete and, and sweep through the population. And remember, there's also recombination happening as well, which was sort of, you know, I think pushed to the margins here just because of the way they did their analysis. But that's another part of the dynamic here that's kind of not considered in this paper. Instead, um, what they did is they wanted to then, now that they've identified these mutations, um, kind of taking an evolutionary view, is there, are there signs that natural selection is acting? Are these being, are these changes being selected on? And so one of the ways that is to analyze this is commonly done by lots of evolutionists is to compare the types of mutations. And there's, we've talked about this on Twivo a lot. There's sort of two flavors of mutation, the non-synonymous where you're um, RNA change leads to a change in the amino acid versus a synonymous or silent change, or because of the degeneracy of the genetic code, even though there's a RNA difference, the amino acid it codes for is the same. And the idea is that selection can see, is more likely to see or act on the non-synonymous changes because that changes the protein. It changes the shape of the protein or the, the, quali the chemical quality at the surface of the protein in a way that might may, may mean that an antibody recognizes that epitope, that surface, better or worse as the, as the um, virus, the spike protein in this case, might be changing. So they do some simple counts and find that among the ISNVs, um, like roughly 5,000 of them are non-synonymous and 1,500 are synonymous or silent. And so immediately you're, th you're thinking, wow, there's a lot of, there's some selection to enrich for these non-synonymous changes. These might be mutations that evade immune recognition, for example. Um, but it's important to remember actually just with the way the genetic code is set up that you'd expect a two to one ratio anyway. And so, um, 
you know, there's definitely an enrichment here for non-synonymous changes, but it's maybe not quite as um, drastic as it first appears. They do note uh, that in the spike protein, though, that that the ratio, um, instead of being sort of 2.5 or 3, go, goes up to 5. Um, and that's, I think, decent evidence that, you know, there is some selection here. The, the patient's immune system is responding to mm. the virus population and, you know, eventually clearing the virus. Um, you know, along the way, this is selecting for um, viruses that can sort of outlast the uh, weaker ones that get picked off somehow. I mean, this is uh, speculating from uh, a genetic signal here, but that would be at least roughly consistent with that. Um, and then, you know, they do, they kind of slice and dice the data in a couple different ways. Um, they look at the demographics here. So um, one of my favorite moments in the paper is that they say that, um, you know, the um, uh, sort of the most mutations are showing up in middle-aged folks, but they define middle-aged from 15 years old to 65 years old, which just made me feel young again. So <laughs> I don't feel bad for being middle-aged if that <laughs> includes all the way down to, to 15 year olds. Um, but, um, you know, a, 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 overall, I think a pretty, uh, looking at this intra-host, um, uh, sort of accumulation of mutations, there's also differences over time, right? So um, if they collect the samples they collected right after the diagnosis of SARS-2, there are graphs in here that show as you then sample, you know, a week later, two weeks later, a month later, that, that you're, there's accumulations of mutations. So the virus is, is mutating, it's changing within the host. Um, and they claim that that rate might even get higher the longer into the infection, which is... Um, sort of an interesting signature there as well. Um, but then finally, you know, the kind of, I think the big point of the paper was then to compare the kinds of changes that they see in individuals to um, that population level. And so here they use a database where you can just recover sequences, SARS-2 sequences. This is the 2019 NCOVR database. Um, I'm not totally, have you heard of this one, Vincent? Mm -hmm. Is this different than Gisade? I'm not totally familiar yeah, with it. No. Yeah. Um, and so then they, they collect these, um, you know, uh, and they have the time dates from when the single, um, sort of sampled consensus sequence showed up from any one patient. Um, and then they want to compare to the ISNVs, the mutations happening in a patient, how do those match up or don't match up at the population level? Um, and so just a quick note of, before we kind of discuss the results, a quick no moment of podcast peer review, which is, um, one of the things I would want to know is how, so the um, ISNVs are all measured with a very specific sequencing pipeline that the authors advance, which is great, um, pretty standard. Um, but what's in that database? Are, and certainly there's going to be a lot of different, most likely there's going to be different hospitals, different patients, different, totally different ways of getting the data. And so some of these SNPs, um, the polymorphisms, because you're collecting the data differently, might sort of look to be more different just because of technical reasons, the sequencing situation. Um, and even the ones that are at high frequency, if there's, you know, depending on how the sequencing is done, the PCR primers that are used for virus capture, et cetera, that could sort of um, influence a little bit of the signal here. Probably at the global level isn't going to like totally wipe out differences, but um, certainly to some degree. Um, so anyway, if we just take it for granted that it's a, a, a decent apples to apples comparison, which I think, you know, grain of salt there, um, among their s s about 7,000 or so mutations that they identified, uh, f they see about 15% of them, um, showing up in the larger database. Um, and then, um, and that's in patients actually before, so there's also a time aspect here, right? So <laughs> that 15%. Are mutations that have been documented before the sampling time that they do their study in, which was before May 2020, and then as the paper was advancing or as their study was advancing, they see another 11% from May to December of 2020. So the kind of the next six months, and so over that window of about a year, um, you know, they capped about maybe 25% a quarter of the mutations that you see in the database from general public versus their subset of patients with individual histories, about a quarter of the mutations match. And so, and it's mm -hmm. the other three quarters that are unique um, to the single patients. And those are, again, I think it's intuitively not too surprising that you'll have mm -hmm. a lot of extra mutations that sort of 
rise and fall within a single patient that don't go on versus the ones that actually, um, you know, are transmitting um, in a population and, and competing against all of them um, in a population going forward. And I think probably there are some that rise and fall before we even pick them up in the population, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and that, you know, we've been, and we've been talking a little bit about just like your sort of your resolution on like a pandemic. Um, yeah. And how this is different than anyone. There's also, you can even slice it, you know, even further and further to like, should we yeah. really care about the mutations that are going to, you know, sort of show up in individual cases, but never sort of see the light of day or never propagate on. But this at least, you know, I think it gives you a, an interesting, um, maybe a rough calculation that three quarters of the mutations are potentially these sort of privately held ones versus the one quarter that might go on. That's, that's kind of interesting. So there's, there's selection in host. Because you don't, it's not random, right? Correct. It's not everywhere. Yep. And then there's selection at at getting out and spreading in the population, which is in, is intuitive, but it's good to see it, right? Yeah, I think so. And so that's what they call this two step fitness differences and yes, just, like, exactly. just like you said. Yeah. Um, and One then, thing now is um, most of the changes are in coding regions. Now. Right. In a non-coding region, there's no thing such thing as a synonymous versus non-synonymous by definition, right? So yep. nevertheless, you can see changes. You may not know what they mean, but why do you think there are so few in coding regions? Yeah, so that's probably well, – so in coding regions, there's two non -coding. things going on here. So we've mostly been talking about positive selection that you – like in, from a virus side of things, that could be immune evasion, et cetera. Um, there's also purifying selection happening here, right? And so – um, you're sampling just as many random mutations, but a lot of them are going to be deleterious. That's kind of, yeah, uh, sure, you know, sure. Our, our thought of mutation. And so they'll be purified out of the population. You need a working spike protein. So you can't just change willy nilly to avoid an antibody, but then not have your function. Um, but you know, I'm glad you brought that up. So the five prime and three prime, the untranslated region, sort of the edges of the genome, um, don't encode genes. They do have function. Um, they're also sort of like, so there's, a relaxed constraint. You could, whatever nucleotide you put there, like will probably be a little more tolerated because you're not encoding like a very specific gene product, a protein that the virus needs as part of its replication cycle. But there's also, here's where, you know, kind of another caution flag where the virus is in, in sequencing, the viruses are spit, and coronavirus in particular, a little bit of long read sequencing we've been doing in our lab we end up getting like just bombarded with these fragments of genomes. Instead of getting a, a whole genome across, you get just a little fragment of the edges, either the beginning, the five prime or the end of the three prime end of the genome. And so the virus, I think, as it's replicating is spitting out tons of worthless mm -hmm. pieces of coronavirus genome. And there is even less constraint there because these are never going to there's no selection acting on something that's never going to become a working virus down the road. Um, and so, yeah, a little, you know, a little caution that there's a, a few things going on there um, in terms of the diversity they're seeing. And so it makes sense and I, for them to focus on the coding regions for that, for that situation. So, yeah, and I think, but in just maybe to just end or conclude on this, you know, really does point out the difference, like once a virus is in a single host, um, and it has established an infection. I mean, it's getting bombarded by the immune system, but it doesn't have all these other challenges necessarily, right? Which is to to transmit to another host, to to live outside of a host on a droplet or something like this, or to become aerosolized and to sort of, you know, go through the obstacles of like, you know, landing in someone's respiratory tract. I mean, there's all of these other, you know, and then competition as, you know, viruses might be showing up at a super spreader event, are they, how is that all getting worked out? And so I think a pretty big difference in um, um, overall outcomes um, when you compare what it what it's like for a virus population in a single host versus competing against in the uh, I also population. Think, I also think cells in one person are different, right? Even in your respiratory, na your nasopharynx, it's, they're all different and slightly Absolutely. different. And that's going to, exert its own selection as well. So it is it is far more varied than we think at first glance. Exactly right. right. And they, they tackle this a little bit. So the sampling they do within the single patients, it's not all. So some of it's sputum, some yeah. of it's um, fecal though. And so this gets at exactly your point um, where um, you can start to even think about are there different sets of mutations that come from viruses that are recovered 
um, from one end versus the other yeah. end of the yeah, patient, sure. right? And the answer I think is yes. Um, and it just points again at the complexity, depending on how deeply you want to go into the infection process, which, you know, in, in making that decision, like how, at what level of resolution do we get useful data back um, for interpreting how these viruses work? It's, it's incredible uh, how deeply you can go into these questions. And even something like this that takes 170 patients, and this is a lot of work, to do that amount of sampling over several months, different samples, all of that data analysis, um, but the, and, and I think, you know, we're glimpsing at um, some patterns here, but are we really, you know, what's the value added, I guess, in terms of biological understanding? I think that's a really open question. Well, I, th I think it's important people think about it because people have this idea that there's a mutation here and that's it and that causes some change. But in fact, in the host, there are just un uncount countless numbers of different genomes, the quasi-species, and yeah. Yeah. you're always selecting on that not on one genome. And the, the, these uh, next strain trees are kind of misleading because it's not just one sequence. It's That's the consensus, right? Yeah. But there are a lot of other changes in there. They may or may not make a difference at the particular time. They may make a difference in the future. It's almost more than you can handle to think about, <laughs> right? It is. That's why, that's why here we are two years on podcasting about the same topic and will be. Um, yeah for a while ahead. And yeah, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, obviously there are some shortcuts or I think some clues about what to think about, which is what is the product of selection? What are the, right? And so um, even as we're working out the virology and that takes patience, that takes time and a different level of investment in the experiments and the, the setup of the experience, et cetera. It, but there's, you know, what is the product or the outcome of selection? And so that's why, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about several variants, or we could even just talk about an, an entire pandemic. SARS-2 is um, pretty different from um, the sort of just uh, cloud of coronaviruses that are SARS-like or SARS-related, um, as they're defined, just littering the phylogenetic trees with no impact on humans at all. This one has emerged from this cloud and really... Um, had a, a, a massive impact um, in the last two years. I think it's plus. important to point out that selection acts at the moment. There's no trajectory. There's no goal yeah. to get to a certain better machine, right? Because yeah. whatever yeah. the selection is, that is what will be pulled out of the, the quasi-species. And then in another person, it may be different. And Omicron is a perfect example. It didn't originate from Delta. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah, perfect. It came, kind of came. Somewhere else. And so somewhere there was selection that favored Omicron versus over Delta, and that now that's predominating. So that's yeah. – <laughs> No, that's evolution, a great point, Vincent. Evolution has no goal. <laughs> evolution has no goal, and it's a moving target. So we as humans are very different um, the, uh, immunologically than we were two years ago. Um, I'm speaking about the many of us uh, listening who are vaccinated and boosted um, three – encounters with a SARS-2 like spike um, or, uh, you know, large populations of people who are naturally infected, whether vaccinated or not, that we're a very different population than we were two years ago. And so, yeah, it's, it, this is a, a dynamic process. So, okay, let's move on to our, our next item. This is a, a post on virological.org. And I think this also gets at this thread of where did Omicron actually come from? And so, um, before we get there, let's set, set this up. So, um, you know, again, science moving in real time, people going through peer review um, and the kind of traditional publishing process, people also just self-publishing, putting up preprints, which might go on for peer review, but immediately available for people to read and digest and consider. This is an example of that at virological.org. The title of the post is Putative Host Origins of RNA Insertions in SARS-CoV-2 genomes. And Vincent has it up on the screen here. Um, open access, publicly available. The authors here, Thomas Peacock, David Bauer, and Wendy Barclay. Um, and they're working in the United Kingdom. This is the Department of Infectious Disease at St. Mary's Medical School, it's Imperial College, London. And then also um, the RNA uh, Virus Replication Laboratory at the Francis <laughs> Crick Institute in London. Um, and so, Kind of a quick summary, or if we just sort of diagnose the title here. So host origins of RNA insertion. So we've been talking 
about point mutations. So the virus has a certain number of letters, RNA letters, 30,000 or so. And the base pair, the base letter is changing or mutating, whether that's a polymorphism, if you, def you can call it that, or you can call it a variation of SNV, ISNV for those intra-host ones. And now we're talking about RNA insertion. So this is a totally different mechanism of mutation where the um, sequence actually, or, or you insert sequence, you add to that 30,000 letters. So you might have 30,000 and 12 letters or 30,000, 24, et cetera. Um, you know, the flip side of the coin is deletions, which also happen. You remove or letters get removed from the genome as it's replicating. And so the host origins here implies, or the idea is, is the source of these insertions. When you're adding to the genome, the SARS-2 genome, where are these letters coming from? And there's some really good evidence for coronaviruses that on occasion it's the host itself that's helping out the virus or providing um, letters to the virus. A little help from your hosts um, is maybe one way of saying it here. Um, and so that's what the authors are doing here. So they're not looking at point mutations, the letter changes, but these um, insertions. Um, and and these are rare events, um, but they get cataloged. So when you go to those databases, um, whether it's GISAID or the um, N2019 COVR database that was used in the last study, um, instead of just the letters changing, there are sometimes notations of insertions. And so the authors here decided to kind of do a deeper dive. What do those insertions actually look like? Um, and what they find is, first of all, there's like a pattern to where you see these insertions. They were looking specifically at the um, spike coding region. So this is about 1,200 base pairs um, or uh, 1,200 RNA letters. And then noting where they just where these insertions were annotated. And most of them are in the so-called NTD, the first 200 letters. This is the shorthand for the N-terminal domain um, upstream, so to speak, of the receptor binding domain um, of the spike protein. And in so, so these insertions, they have different um, numbers of letters. So some are, usually they're in multiples of three, uh, meaning that they actually are for codon. So you add amino acids and you might add a dozen amino acids or you might add three amino acids. And so then what they did is they went back and they took those letters and they did a comparison to every genetic database out there and asked, okay, are there matches for these letters um, to, uh, what we've already seen. And so the answer is yes. And in some cases it's actually other coronaviruses. Um, and so this is this process of recombination where um, with template switching. So as the virus genome is replicating, it's going along a strand of RNA and then it might jump to another strand of RNA and then jump back um, to recombine. Um, and if that other strand has more letters, that would be one way of getting this. If it just actually grabs a few of those letters, jumps back would be another way um, of this happening. Um, or in rare cases, um, the authors are putting forward some evidence that those letters like really match identically to the host sequence, the human sequences. And so the notion is that as the virus is replicating, it's actually jumping onto host transcripts, gaining the sequence and then, um, hopping back, um, to finish out the, the rest of the, the, the virus sequence. So. Um, this is pretty interesting because if that's true, and there's, you know, first of all, you know, a little bit of a caveat here, a major caveat is that a lot of these sequences are really short. So it might be nine RNA letters for three amino acids. And so just the chance that you're going to get a match in the genomic database for this um, is pretty high. Um, and so you can't really discern whether that's a match because by chance, um, just because those letters are bound to show up. Um, and from other locations, just as a normal mutation process, just as you're changing letters, something that's eight out of a nine match might become a nine out of nine match and then fool you into thinking that this was this insertion process. So um, that's a, a huge grain of salt here. But um, the, if that's true, um, and big but, if, but if that's true, then um, it's pretty interesting or it could give you some clues about, <laughs> okay, where has this virus been as it had emerged? And so even for Omicron, they point out... Um, uh, an insertion um, that matches human sequence perfectly. It's very short. And so um, I wouldn't like 
put money on this, but that could be a clue if that's if that's right, that Omicron was recently, and this is uh, different than that of other variants out there, that it was recently gained that from a human patient, an immunocompromised patient, one of the major sort of the leading hypothesis um, of how Omicron might have emerged. Um, some of the other ideas out there, which I think are like basically almost equally, you know, there's enough evidence on either side, basically, is that this could be a spill back event that so we know there's plenty of evidence that SARS-2 can make its way into uh, wildlife or into other species. Um, rodents, for example, deer um, in the U.S. was kind of recently uh, in the headlines. Um, and so that's another given that, you know, as we were looking at those trees, kind of glimpsing at those trees before and Omicron's long branch, different from anything else, certainly distinct from Delta, could it have been hiding out either in a immunocompromised patient or, uh, you know, or another human sort of gathered, excuse me, those like collection of private eye snivs um, that we were discussing before. Um, or is this so different that it was actually selection was acting on a different species and then hmm. spilling um, back into humans from there? I and mean, I think, um, I, I don't know if we'll ever know, but I think that's, the, you know, people are curiously looking for evidence that might point one way or the other. So we have two origins. We have the origin of a sequence from elsewhere in the SARS-CoV-2 genome, right? Yeah. Either close by or distant. They have some examples of both. Or perhaps from the host, and they note some genes that seem to be the origins, right? Which is not yeah. which is not unprecedented. It's happened for other viruses, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, and this is the reason this one caught my eye, both because I think it speaks to how folks are thinking about, you know, as variants are rising and falling where they might be coming from. But also, so I'm fascinated by that process of viruses picking up sequence yeah. from yeah, yeah. hosts, right? And so in my lab, we're trying to build systems to capture these events in the laboratory. They're really rare. Mm -hmm. and so can we set up experiments that select, artificially yep. Yep. <laughs> select yep. for being able to do that? And if we can, then this is how we might like reverse engineer some of these signals. So how common is it that we see the virus capturing host sequence. If we know that probability and we know what that looks like because we've captured it in the lab, that might give us a better sort of lens to observe these natural occurrences and to say, you know, that could have happened at this frequency or probability, or that's really unlikely. You need to see, you know, a dozen um, amino acids to really get a sense of what it's grabbing. But if we, if I had that information, if I could tell you the probability that that would happen, that could sort of help us step forward to maybe not definitively like smoking gun say, okay, this sequence came here hundred percent for sure, but we would know we'd have a, a much better sense of how these viruses are operating. And so it's kind of a call for traditional virology where we, um, you know, we, we plan experiments, we get the, we set them up safely and we learn about how viruses work by putting them through the paces. And so that's, you know, that's, that takes time and effort and it's a much slower pace than reading these genomes in real time and making inferences but i think it's ultimately our understanding will depend on us hitting it in, in both directions so you you said you're a little unsure about uh some of that right because the sequences are so short right so yeah uh, it, will this amount to anything or is it an observation that will then just <laughs> no, so I think there's something to this. And so actually one of, <laughs> one of the most interesting cases is one of the pandemics of coronaviruses before SARS-2, MERS. Mm -hmm. um, and there, um, really well documented that not only was it a few amino acids that the virus is grabbing, it grabbed a whole host gene, a phosphodiesterase. And so this is yeah. a really interesting um, piece of biology that um, current postdoc in my lab, Stephen Goldstein, um, was working on as a as a grad as a grad student has got his PhD in Susan Weiss's lab working on this question. Mm -hmm. um, and so these phosphodiesterases are actually, we think, end up in coronavirus genomes to short circuit one of our major immune defenses. Um, and that is this this antiviral pathway that goes through these funny sick messenger nucleotides. And I won't go into the weeds here, but basically it looks like these viruses captured a host gene that can that can um, kill the messenger. It can cut that, that chemically cut that messenger in half right. so that the message doesn't go forward. That is, Hey, 
<laughs> you've got a coronavirus infection as a cell on your hands here, time to shut down the cell and try to save the whole animal here. And so, yeah, there's so that this phenomenon is certainly well described and um, pretty clear in some cases, but now it's sort of inching back to the edges where I'm sure this happens, but how frequently it happens and how do we like actually know, um, or how can, can we start to differentiate between just the regular course of point mutations that can look like if you get the right combination, it can look very much like a capture event versus a, a bona fide capture event. And so, yeah, I think that's a, a wide open question in coronavirus virology. There's an example in poliovirus where there's a piece of, uh, ribosomal RNA stuck in in one of the viruses and it probably is because when the polymerase was copying poliovirus RNA, it bumped into a ribosome and copied a few, uh, it took 20 or 30 bases and then went back to the virus and it didn't have any effect and it stayed there. It seemed to be neutral, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I love this. And so viruses do this all the time. The basis of oncogenes was broken open, right? So these are the genetic basis of cancer, the genes that can contribute to cancer susceptibility. Yeah, yeah. Um, where was this found? Bishop and Varmus found this in a chicken retrovirus was a host gene just sitting there that can that in, that's involved in cell growth control, uh, you know, cell yeah. fate de decision. Yeah, sure. And so these viruses, even this, even some of the smaller ones. So coronaviruses are kind of super tankers of RNA viruses. Poliovirus is small. These retroviruses are small, but even as you're pointing out they're occasionally getting in on this game, which is to get a little help from the hosts, genetically speaking, to, to gain some of the sequence. It's really, really fascinating. And then some of the DNA viruses, the big ones, the giant viruses, um, which I think was the last time we were together in person, Vincent, was the giant virus meeting in the yeah. fall of 2019. Oh boy, November 2019, yeah. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> no, more than two years ago. Um, these things are specialists in gene capture. And so they, you know, maybe a quarter of their genomes are actually host genes that somehow landed, got co-opted into the virus genome and then diverged and sort of switched teams in a sense from a genetic standpoint, in some cases actually promoting virus replication. I think this is a matter of under the microscope and that's why we're seeing all this stuff that we normally wouldn't see, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's the trick here. It's the same challenge that we were discussing even in the first pre-proof is as we, yeah, as we look closer and closer, you start in, I think it's, it's a very human um, sort of pattern that we're, or, the, or a human instinct to look for patterns and it to, is. right. And to sort of um, in some cases overfit patterns, that's sort of how our brains are wired up. And so as a scientist, you're always trying to remind yourself that, you know, hold on, am I letting some of my own bias come in here? Or how could I explain this differently and build a set of evidence or that might, that, you know, might not hundred percent prove it one way or another, but at least we're like kind of building a case and, and, and trying to get closer to the truth. Um, but that's a, that's a challenge because uh, our human brain isn't inherently scientific in some sense, I would say. Well, this is what scientists do, right? They make observations, and in the current pandemic, you can make a lot of observations because there's a, there are a lot of data. And if you note, this one is published at virological.org, and they probably just wanted to get it out there and see what people think. Other scientists, are you seeing this? Do you think it means anything? They're not even submitting it for publication, right? And so that That's tells right. you, you know, there's so many levels of communication in this pandemic. There's the, the preprint. There's the... The uh, what is the one just before publication that we just did? What is that called yeah, again? Pre-proof. <laughs> Pre-proof. Then there's the yep. published manuscript, yep. and then we have websites like virological.org where people put a lot of uh, information, but they're not necessarily manuscripts. So we're seeing a diversification of communication of uh, data, and that's appropriate given the the fire hose, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And then we're as scientists, we're also trying to share this right in real time. Um, that's what we're doing here on our mm -hmm. live stream. And then, um, you know, uh, doing our best to respond in real time to questions as they go through Vincent's virological live, a, a great example of this, of, you know, really trying to expand the conversation here. Um, it's, it's really, when you step back and look at it, um, I think it's really remarkable, um, that how we're all responding, um, 
And it, it's some, sometimes it uh, can obviously be, you know, really frustrating and it feels like, well, what's going on here? This thing is really dragging out. Um, and, um, uh, but I think I, I wouldn't be surprised if a few years from now we're looking back at, um, it's sort of an incredible innovation in terms of communicating science at all levels and at a speed that we just, you know, um, is really different than how a lot of science works. And in yeah. fact, um, part of stepping through this, I think in the bigger picture is going to involve that slower track of, um, science unfolding to, to go from these very quick observations to an understanding of, like through an experimental system to manipulate, a, um, whether it's a virus or the conditions, the host cells, whatever it is, and to squeeze some information by uh, making experimental manipulations take a lot longer. But as these sort of tracks start to converge or come together, um, our understanding of this will um, will increase a lot. And hopefully, um, as kind of the past generations of science have sort of come right in the nick of time in terms of the knowledge that went into the mRNA vaccines to quickly deploy those in about a year, you know, will we have a new understanding about how um, pandemics can work from this kind of analysis that might really come in nick of time a decade from now, SARS-4, SARS-5, or whatever um, inevitable pandemic is down the road. Indeed. Now, do you want to take some of these uh, questions here and see? Yeah, what let's we do can that. Do with them? There's Could some... you? So my. Oh, here we go. So. I'll, do you I'll, have I'll, these? I have them here. I'll bring them up as I. Okay. Yeah. They see them. There was one a while ago. Let's see if I can find it. <laughs> <laughs> um let's see hang on take your time i was trying to get the the um youtube um window up but then with our um two challenges with echoes i just abandoned it so I'm, you have to turn off your volume but then you won't be able yeah. to hear me right yeah exactly so i'm still <laughs> i'm working that out in our somewhat new live streaming era but um yeah i would love to go back on the timeline here and field a few questions. Uh, a lot of questions, tons, tons, as we've been chatting away. <laughs> okay, we got back to the echo. That's good. <laughs> Here's a good one. Does fitness advantage mean survivability advantage? Yeah, so fitness is sort of this loaded term in evolutionary biology. And so um, ultimately, yeah, survivability certainly overlaps with the notion of fitness. So um, one way of kind of breaking it down from an evolutionary standpoint is, um, you know, so at the gene level or at the, like, so the idea of, um, sequences or genes going on to the next generation mm -hmm. relative to like within a population. And so, um, and of course, as genes associate with animals, organisms, then, um, or viruses, um, it, the way you, you can count this, um, which gets at sort of survivability, the way you might count the fitness of some sequence or some variant or whatever it is, is by its proportion within that population. Um, uh, and, and, and that kind of cuts on two levels. So one is in the population of every sort of thing that's like currently alive, if it's an animal, but that also applies to everything that's like everything that's been lost al along the way. And so that, and that's again, sort of where survivability would come in um, ultimately is that, um, you know, fitness goes forward, but it doesn't necessarily have to depend on survivability because fitness can also be defined in terms of what's sort of on the plate today um, through uh, at a population level. And, and a related question, wouldn't yeah. fitness only replace other variants at an equal rate? If there's huge increases in COVID as Omicron takes over, that must suggest something else is going on. Well, so I think the problem is huge increases. You don't know what's driving them, right? It may not right. just be the fitness. It may be what people are doing, which I've always said is a huge factor in the, the propagation of a virus in a, in a population, right? So we're now in the holiday period. That that by itself is driving uh, outbreaks. Does that make no, sense? Absolutely. Nils? It does. Yeah. And so that's that the part of this idea of fitness is also the, the environment matters. So like, yeah. so, so you want to be a little bit careful with survivability because the environment matters, right? So, um, yeah. And so if it's, so the fitness of a virus, you know, to take your example, Vincent, 
during a non-holiday period or when people are like totally spread apart that like some set of mutations that allows this thing to just sort of like hang on by its fingernails, so to speak, um, might be <laughs> more fit versus uh, <laughs> at a high density, like a holiday scenario, something that can transmit between like potential hosts that are very yeah. close might be more fit there. And so this is again where that, in, in terms of like the difference rates, this is where this idea of selection coefficients come in. And so that's also changing. So all changes to a variant are not necessarily created equal. You might have a mutation that has a 1% coefficient of selection, meaning that it, you know, you're, you're, you're 1% better at replicating relative to the main population if you gain that mutation versus one that's 10% or even 100%, um, which is sort of a game-changing mutation. Um, and it's in that sort of 10% plus space that Omicron is kind of catching some of the population geneticists a little bit off guard. So yeah, it can be quite variable depending on sort of the advantage gained by that genetic change. Here's one for you, Nels. What's your favorite experiment you've done in your lab? <laughs> it's, usually, it's always the last one that we've done, <laughs> so, right? Because the ones, <laughs> the ones that you've done 10 years ago, the ones that you've done you know, longer ago, um, you know the answer to that one. And it's, but it's that last experiment where that fresh result comes in where you've learned something new that no one has seen yet before. That's my favorite Man, experiment. That's good. Because, yeah. All right, another one for you. What are some of the most crucial observations, principles of evolutionary theory that are helpful for scientists in a pandemic? Yeah. Ooh, this is a great one. Actually, this will... Um, Maybe we'll, I'll, I'll save this one for our um, picks of the week. We're going to be talking about some more virus evolution, but in some really sort of uh, unexpected places. I think, um, I think uh, yeah, so I'll get to that in a minute. But to answer the question now, um, you know, all of these, I think what, well, to maybe to put it kind of bluntly, I think a lot of evolutionary biologists, population geneticists, have sort of held viruses to the side of sort of quote unquote mainstream evolution. So, you know, you might think um, that they're, they're, you know, they evolve fast, they're, it's a different beast, it's whatever. And then you kind of set them aside and then you and then you want to think about, okay, well, what does average evolution look like at a population level where a generation doesn't take, you know, half an hour or four hours or whatever, where it takes 18 years or something like that. Like that's where, um, and I think what the viruses have done, what SARS-2 has done is to remind everyone, hold on, this is all part of the same conversation, these bursts of evolution and the impact these things have on our own evolution, our immune systems, our immune responses, right? Even our behavior. And so um, I think I'm going to hold out there that, um, you know, it's, maybe it's a circular answer, but the viruses themselves um, and um, hold bringing that into the mainstream has a lot to teach us about, or, or the lesson, I guess, is to bring viruses into the mainstream of the conversation from an evolutionary standpoint. Hmm. Uh, this is uh, a lot of good questions here. Are viruses all one copy or different versions of one variant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this has become the alphabet soup of, uh, or the, you know, how do, how do we talk about these things? All of the controversy, even from a year ago, should we be, you know, are these new strains um, versus variants versus, in, in the end, I think it's all, it's kind of a continuum. It's a spectrum from uh, genetic, being genetically identical, a clone, um, to then being a, like a variant could go as far as completely different there, but there is some value in our words. And so, you know, for me, I guess um, the idea of if, a uh, variant of SARS-2, for example, def completely defeats all vaccines. We need a, you know, then we should, then I'm ready to talk about a new strain, for example. I think that that part of our language comes into play there. But um, yeah, there's I think there's no there's no right or wrong answer here. It's all kind of on a, shades of a spectrum as we describe genetic diversification. Did you see that uh, Lebanon seems to have Omicron earlier than South Africa in covariance? What do you think about that? Is that just a reporting issue, Nels? Yeah, uh, I think w w I wouldn't be surprised. So um, if that, um, yeah, that Omicron's, uh, so we may never exactly trace the origins, the exact, like day one, where did um, where was Omicron emerging from? Um, but I, I, I agree that like South Africa is probably, like I wouldn't, 
and this is an issue I have with the travel bans is that we're sort of, you know, we're reacting to something. And again, mm. I think we need to take into account ascertainment bias. So one of the great things about South, South Africa is they have really good genomic surveillance of SARS-2. Um, this is like super commendable. And the fact that this was transparent and shared really quickly is like massive. Like this is how, like, this is how we adapt to a pandemic to do better is exactly that impulse. Um, but I think it's, but it, then, you know, the danger here is that we sort of like, you know, the old cliche of killing the messenger. So we put a travel ban on South Africa when this thing is already, we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're reacting to it. It's already on the loose everywhere and probably showed up originally somewhere else. And so, yeah, yeah I think we'll probably continue to see evidence. Um, and so, the, you know, one way to do this is again, to build those trees. So you take the virus samples from different locations, build a tree, and then see how they all relate to each other. Um, and then when you add a molecular clock, and as you're kind of counting the shared number of, of mutations, then you can start to infer um, the earliest appearance and then correlate that with a location. And yeah, I would I would actually be shocked if it was South Africa, given that they're just they're looking for the, they've got one of the few places that have a really good flashlight looking for SARS too. And so, you know, where you're, you're shining the flashlight is your is where you're more likely to see something than all of the events that are happening in the dark. All right. Now, do you want to do some picks uh, and then we can thank some of our donors here today? Absolutely. That sounds great. So, um, you know, um, a lot of virus discussion on um, this week in evolution. Um, and there is a lot of interesting evolution out there. I'm not going to break free from viruses, but I'm going to bring us to a completely different virus location. I think both Vincent and I are going to do this in our picks of the week. So my pick is a paper, uh, sort of my stocking stuffer, my holiday science pick. Um, and this is open access. Uh, like a big recommend to take, a, if you're interested in viruses, but want to break from SARS-2, check out this recent paper on cucumber mosaic virus. So this is a cool paper that's not only a virus, there's actually a satellite RNA, just a snippet of sequence that's coming along for the ride here. Um, and the combination of the two, the virus and the satellite RNA, are implicated in, um, in, in their spread through plants and aphids. And so the title of the paper is A Plant Virus Satellite RNA Directly Accelerates Wing Formation in Its Insect Vector for Spread. And so we'll have the link up at our um, on the uh, micro TV website. Are you also putting this? Can you put this up in the chat somehow? The link does that work, Vincent? I can do that. Yep, that'd be sure. great. So basically, the take home here is a co infection with this cucumber mosaic virus, plant virus, in the satellite RNA, it changes the color of the host plant to attract aphids. So, this, this is um, it's called cucumber mosaic virus. I think they're this is uh, in tobacco plants. The plant, the red le or the um, green leaves turn more yellow. This attracts aphids. Um, and then that's in combination mm. with that satellite RNA, the aphids actually both turn from green to red, grow wings at a higher number, and then transmit the combo of the virus and the satellite RNA more broadly. Um, and so this is wild, right? So this is a virus teaming up with a snippet of RNA to change a plant's mm. color and a aphid's color and change its development so that it will fly more often with, I mean, if we, if we were ever in doubt that viruses can do pretty amazing things, here's a really cool example of it. So that's my science pick of the week. Yeah, it's the, the plant viruses uh, can have interesting effects. Um, they can change the the organics produced by plants to attract aphids that will pick the virus up and bring it elsewhere. For example, it's really remarkable. And remember, this is all just random stuff that happens. Not planned by anybody. That's right. Mutation and selection is is it. It's it. Is wild. Yeah. It's very cool. Uh, so I have a pick that is based on a discussion we had in, in Virology Live. Uh, I guess that would be maybe Monday. Someone asked whether plant other viruses can switch kingdoms, right? <laughs> <laughs> cool. Or at least plants to uh, animals, let's say. And, yeah. and way back in 2010, I wrote a, a blog post, A Plant Virus That Switched to Vertebrates. It's based on a paper uh, published in 99. And it doesn't matter how old it is, folks. It doesn't have to be 
today to be interesting. And so I do like from time to time to dredge up uh, older stuff. Evidence that a plant virus switched hosts to infect the vertebrate and then recombined with a vertebrate infecting virus. This was published in PNAS. And um, so this is all about circoviruses. These are uh, viruses with circular single-stranded DNA genomes uh, that infect vertebrates. And then nanoviruses are similar in genome structure. They infect plants. And the genes encoding one of the viral proteins, the rep protein, which is important for driving uh, re DNA replication, it, it hijacks the host apparatus. Uh, they appear to be hybrids, uh, have similarity to both. Uh, and they also have similarity to a protein encoded by calici viruses, which are RNA viruses that infect different vertebrates as well. So sequence analysis has, has suggested a scenario where a nanovirus was transmitted from a plant to a vertebrate. And this, the idea would be, well, maybe a vertebrate was feeding on the plant, right? That happens. <laughs> and maybe the virus adapted to the vertebrate further. I mean, it could have already been close enough just by random mutation. Uh, and that establishes the circovirus family. And then after this host switch, recombination took place between the circovirus and a vertebrate Khaleesi virus. Um, and, and finally, uh, reverse transcriptase could have converted the RNA genome to DNA to allow the re recombination to occur. And so uh, it's an interspecies transmission event, um, which happens all the time, as you know. Yep. So um, I, many people have criticized this as not being definitive. And of course, you can't be because this happened, it happened so long ago, you're never going to get proof for it. But I think it's an interesting hypothesis. There are alternative explanations, of course, but it's, uh, I'm sure that these have not um, never happened. They, they have happened before, and it's very hard to find evidence of it. And that's, that's what we can do by looking at this. Yeah, really cool. Yeah, I'd also maybe lift up for these like massive host ranges even between kingdoms, some of these giant viruses actually, so that you pull out of, um, you know, water cooler towers or yeah. ponds yeah. or oceans that can actually, in some cases, um, I think it's a little bit controversial, but uh, transmit all the way to humans um, with yeah. macrophage sort of phagocytosis events. Still, I think working out the fine details there, but um, I wouldn't put it past viruses to, um, there's clear evidence that they're, they're, <laughs> they can be pretty general. I think it's important to emphasize that proving things takes a long time. Yeah. And, and you know, in a pandemic, you're, you're not going to prove very much because it's too fast. And, you know, a week after Omicron was discovered, already was more transmissible, more virulent or less virulent, whatever you want to pick. And it's just not possible that you can figure that out in such a short time. Yet the press amplifies it and spreads it around the world. So uh, yeah. that's in part why we do these podcasts, to try and get you information, uh, level-headed information that you can use. Um, and I think it's a worthy goal. And Nels, I thank you for joining me in it. It's very nice of you to do that. Vincent, it's my pleasure, <laughs> um, of course. And, um, you know, sitting in for a couple minutes on Virology Live, um, I came right as you were, um, I think you have two cameras there and showing your Christmas tree as you get ready <laughs> to right. celebrate the holidays here. Um, and so that's my wish too for everyone is happy holidays from whether it's Christmas or any other holiday um, from the Swedish tradition of good Yule. Good Yule. Uh, that's cool. I like that. <laughs> Celebrating. Can you see? Can you speak uh, fluent Swedish now? Uh, very little, no. very little. So, yeah. But um, but I do sort of like to observe, you know, so a lot of people, and for great reasons, like use the holidays to connect, right? To, yeah. to travel, to, to reunite with folks. I've kind of fallen back on the other tradition, on the other end of the spectrum, which is sort of going to hibernation at about this time of the year as we have the winter solstice, the low amount of light to sort of hunker down for a few weeks. And I think the timing is right for that given uh, yeah. current pandemic conditions. Um, but we'll keep, in the new year, we'll, we'll return, come, I'll come out of hibernation. We'll be continuing to podcast both at kind of calibrating that difference between scientific speed that Vincent's talking about and um, sort of press speed, which is a, a huge disconnect and ongoing massive challenge in the pandemic. But the conversations are good and we have many to go in the years ahead. Looking forward to that. And hopefully we get back to non-virus evolution because we used to do a lot of that. And it's really interesting. <laughs> so interesting. We've got some great guests 
ahead working on different aspects of not just virus evolution, but evolution. Mm. Um, some of the stories that have emerged in the last few months, I have a growing catalog of, you know, Twivos that will, um, yeah, Twivos when we can take a breath and step back and consider yeah. some other evolutionary concepts, which will, I think, surprisingly, as one of the questions we, we were fielding, like, thinking about evolution in general somehow can really help to tune our radars for thinking about evolution in pandemic conditions too. And so it's mm -hmm. really worth it to mm -hmm. take that, that broad look. And so that's on our menu for Twivos ahead in 2022. And what we're doing here is on each of the pods, we're talking about science and you're listening to our discussion. And I think that can be instructive for you. That's always been my idea that you hear scientists talk and you learn how they think and you learn about what the data mean from them. I don't think you should learn it from mass media. I think that's a different story altogether. And so that's what I'm trying to do. And I, that's why I appreciate your support. So let me thank some of you uh, who have contributed on this, uh, this stream here. Thank you, Mark. Breakfast time donation uh, for the incubator. So this is the incubator. And here it is, a different view, uh, which you can see here. Um, and all of this is made possible by your donations. I wouldn't be able to do this uh, on my own. So we thank you. Thank you, JL, for your contribution. Uh, from Paris, very good. Good to have you here. Uh, Pamela, thank you so much for your contribution. I love it that people want to help us out and recognize uh, what it is that we're trying to do here. Lot, and, I, and I love the conversations you have amongst yourselves as well. It is, uh, I don't know if you see that scrolling by now, but it's pretty cool. Yeah, I've, I've been <laughs> in my sort of hibernating state, uh, partial hibernation. I don't have the YouTube up, but I will next time get that sorted. So I've got my audio all worked out so I can watch that stream. I, I agree. I was glimpsing a little bit at the questions you were fielding earlier today on Virology Live and really incredible questions. Great conversation. Great moderators. Big thanks to, to, the, to them as well um, for really uh, making this possible, for breathing life into this conversation. It's really great. And I guess you'll be back in a few hours um, with Amy fielding even yeah. more questions. So yeah, in a, yeah, in a few hours, a Q&A &A with A&V and with Amy, and uh, that'll that'll complete a day's uh, worth of streaming, three different streams, Wow, um, which I love doing. I'm glad I'm able to do it. Thank you, Gabriel, for your contribution. Uh, really appreciate it. And I want to thank the um, moderators, Mr. Ozzy, Cam, Steph, and um, Les for being here today. Really appreciate it. Thank uh, you. Keeping things in order, which we need. We couldn't do it uh, without you. Um, uh, let's see. Excellent discussion. Where is that? Let me grab it. Uh, my takeaway, good time to hunker down and hibernate. <laughs> <laughs> That's what well, I'm advocating for. <laughs> here in New York, it's hard to hibernate. Uh, so uh, I still interact with people, but it's a uh, Mark. Thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, really appreciate it. And yeah, Nels, we should set you up so that you can have a second. You must have another laptop that you can put and just run the comments on that so you can see them. So you don't have exactly. to exactly. Uh, next you know? time I will. I'll be a little more organized. Yeah, and 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 Pete just suggested you need a second device running the stream with the sound off. That's yeah, good very call. Simple. Get my phone running next time. I have I have multiple devices here. I don't know if you can see them, but I have a laptop in front of me. This is not running the this, this stream is being run on another projector, and the laptop I can have the sound off and so forth. So yeah, very cool. That's very that's the incubator for you. And yeah, Paul, thank you so much for your contribution. We appreciate it as well. So folks, thank you for coming today, and um, be safe over the holidays. Um, Nels, I will see you next year and be safe as well. Have a happy new year. Thanks, Vincent. Same to you. Thanks for all the work you're doing. Really appreciate My it. My pleasure. Um, and Nels, people are saying you should go to the Q and A sometime. One of these nights we'll have you join yeah, us. Yeah, come in. Fun. I can't make it this evening, but let's, let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks everybody. See you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>